This is Peter John with the DX Headlines. I've talked about being pedestrian mobile on the HF bands before. It's quite difficult to achieve QSOs working with a 4 feet antenna and much less than 10 watts in single sideband. Sometimes much longer antennas and much bigger output powers are also being used. Searching on YouTube you can find several of these QSOs in single sideband over thousands of kilometers, in one case even from Europe to Australia. In the military, working portable on HF was quite common before VHF and UHF equipment became commonplace. The first to make handheld radios for HF for amateurs was probably Japanese one-man company Mitsuho in the 80s. There have been other brands, but especially the last couple of years it's getting more popular slowly. After this you hear a part of a QSO taken from YouTube of Victor Kilo 3 Papa Tango from mainland Australia working Victor Kilo 0 Papa Delta at KC station Antarctica on 20 meters with a Mitsuho radio and only 2 watts in the telescopic antenna of 4 feet that is native to the Mitsuho rig, not less than 2400 miles. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, you are five by eight, five by eight. I'm running two watts, two watts, and a handheld transceiver. Two watts and a handheld transceiver. Uh, VK3 Papa Tango, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Two watts is amazing. Uh, getting all this way, two watts with a handheld. Uh, I'd love to talk a bit longer, but uh, there's a lot of people waiting. So thank you very much for the contact and uh, hope to work you again sometime. Uh, seven three from me. Seven three, Paul. Thanks very much. Antennas that fly under a kite have been used since very long. In fact, the lightning experiment of Benjamin Franklin that took place in 1752 can be seen as a kind of an early antenna experiment. Most important with modern kite antennas are a few things. The kite that is used has to behave in a slow, preferably immobile fashion and must work over a broad range of wind speeds. Almost exclusively one-line kites are being used, no steering. It has to be able to find its own place in the wind. A kite has to be able to carry a fair amount of weight for an antenna. Nylon wire that is normally used for kite flying isn't very heavy, but antenna wire gets quite heavy if it is more than a few tens of meters, and a lot of operators decide to have tuned antennas using coaxial cable. For HF, a long cable without coax can be an option, but for VHF and UHF this is less suitable. In addition to that, for VHF UHF you also need cable that is much more heavy. Some people choose to use a transceiver that is right below the kite, including antenna, as a kind of a simple repeater. Very suitable are for example HTs that have a crossband relay function like the Woksun KG UV9D, which is also not very expensive. The operator on the ground can operate for example on 2 meters, while the stations being worked are on 70 centimeters. The Woksun will be just below the kite and the operator below works simplex on one of the bands. Be aware that this option is not legal in every country. Of course, it is also possible to think of something home-built that works similar, perhaps using Wi-Fi for communication to the transceiver below the kite. Another problem is that of static electricity that can and will build up on kite antennas. With antennas using coax, using for example three resistors of 100 kilo ohm parallel with the coax cable will effectively prevent static electricity being able to build up. To complete this, a high-speed varistor or similar can be added to dampen transients. When using only a one-wire conductor, this problem can also occur and it is much more complicated to think of a solution. SOTA or Summits on the Air has been designed to make participation possible for all radio amateurs and shortwave listeners. It's an awards program, but it's not just for mountaineers. There are awards for activators, that is those who ascend to the summits, and chasers who either operate from home or a local hilltop or even activators on other summits. SOTA is used in nearly 100 countries across the world. Each country has its own association which defines the recognized SOTA summits within that association. Each summit earns the activators and chasers a score which is related to the height of the summit. 
Certificates are available for various scores, leading to prestigious Mountain Goat and Shack Sloth trophies. An honor roll for activators and chasers is maintained at the SOTA online database. So it's meant to activate the hills or mountains by making a radio contact from there with other ham radio operators. There are a few basic rules. Everything should be legal, so you have to have permission of the landowner for example. Operating from vehicles is not permitted and the final access to the summit should be person powered, for example hiking or mountain biking. No fossil fueled generators, batteries or solar panels are permitted. All equipment should be carried by yourself to the summit. And one person can only claim each summit once a year. And of course the environment in general should be respected. In addition to SOTA there's also a similar POTA, parks on the air, and an IOTA, an islands on the air. The Netherlands has a colorful history with its offshore radio stations of the past. Only a few of them have been commercially successful until they were stopped by a new law that didn't make broadcasts from sea illegal but did prohibit working for such a station and buying advertising time. This made it commercially impossible to operate such a station although there were several attempts after 31 August 1974 when the new law took effect. The Netherlands had two very successful stations. One of them was Radio Veronica and the other was Radio North Sea International RNI. RNI ceased to exist after August 31, 1974, but Veronica, after a few years, became part of the non commercial state funded Dutch public broadcasting system and later became commercial again and still exists under the same name. I myself used to work as a freelancer for their publishing company for 14 years. Veronica as an offshore radio station was an extremely commercial enterprise, but during that time and later was also surrounded with a lot of sentiment. It tended to support the Dutch music industry, which also worked the other way round, while RNI, on the other hand, was more of a typical commercial station, just like many stations now in the USA. RNI played music that was popular either Dutch or foreign. This divide was also true for the ending of the stations. Ending of the offshore broadcasts of Veronica left very much more than RNI a lasting scar with the Dutch population and many people that remember this can still be mad about it until today. Until the 90s, broadcasting was heavily regulated all through Western Europe. It wasn't censored though, but commercial stations were prohibited in many countries. What was there were public broadcasting stations that had a large focus on what they saw as educating the people much more than amusement. People on the radio had to speak correct Dutch in the correct variant of the language and the main pain point was that the stations didn't have any horizontal programming in the Netherlands. Each day of the week at the same hour you could hear a completely different show, most often with different music or spoken words in different ways. This was in part the reason for the huge success of the pirate stations that did have the same show at the same time every day. Nowadays the former radio ships are very much romanticized by many people. Most shows in fact were pre-recorded on land but staying at the stations at sea which applied for the news crews, a skeleton team of program makers and for example technicians was in fact not easy. The North Sea is famous for its bad weather but it was also the secluded life especially in a time without any things like mobile phones or other affordable communications. This was Peter John for the DX Headlines on the Mighty KBC.